Welcome to The Way Podcast on FM 91.7 WHUS stores at the top of the hour. To find more, go to podcasttheway.com. I'm your host, Bill Trofeski. Today's topic is stoicism. I am sitting with Anderson Silver. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, Bill. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. It's a good day. And you are the writer of the well-received Stoicism for Better Life series. Can you tell me what that includes? Yeah, so it's a three-book series. The first one is called uh, Your User's Manual, which is a very um, summarized kind of high-level overview of Stoicism only about, you know, 80 some odd pages, 90 pages. And it was so well received that I decided to keep writing uh, more detailed books. So the second one is called Your Duality Within, which addresses this uh, duality we all have. You know, we have this intelligent, rational mind that has a capacity for such greatness. And then we have this decrepit, animal, primitive brain. Um, So we explore that topic. And the third book is, uh, which was released um, today, actually, uh, not not today, the day you're hearing this episode, but today <laughs> they were recording this episode called uh, Your Dichotomy of Control, which uh, tackles the question of what can we control in life and how we can control uh, it as hard as we can because time is so short. Your duality within, does that include a lot of the, what's it called? There's like three types, of drawn a blank. <laughs> so there's this mind-body duality that, that uh uh, permeates uh, philosophy. Uh, some people believe in the duality. Uh, some people believe. Uh, so there's the. Let me take a step back. If we go back to Plato and Aristotle, it's idealism versus realism. Is the world around us real, uh, uh, empirically speaking, or is everything just an idea in our head? And uh, Stoicism kind of takes a dualist approach, a compatibilist approach, uh, and says. We're both, we, we, you know, both there's a world around us, a physical world. So in our case, we have this physical body uh, that, that um, it manifests itself in this physical body from in, in, in our subjective uh, uh, first person shooter reality. But then there's also the mind uh, that has this cognitive capacity for uh, thought that's far surpasses what the body can do, right? We have the sciences using our cognitive imagination that have um, I don't know, done calculations in the fourth dimension, right? Uh, yet our animal brains cannot possibly conceive what that looks like. So we can talk about structures like the hypercube or the tesseract uh, that we've mathematically kind of put out there and we can show how its reflection would look in three dimensions, but our brains cannot conceive how this thing would look because it would be in four dimensions. So it's these kind of crazy dualities that, that uh, the book tackles. And I'd say it's more anthropological, the first half of that book, I explain where this duality comes from, why it exists. And in the second half, I kind of give um, some steps, mainly predominated by Stoicism, on how to control uh, you know, uh, the, the animal primitive mind and, and try to tap more into the power of that higher capacity that we have. Got it. When you say uh, capacity, that makes me think of infinity and like the space is endless, but yet we, don't, we can't physically picture that in our minds. Exactly. But we can put into context. And exactly. what I was trying to say before that I completely drew a blank on, does that um the animalistic part versus the scientific, does that include the ID, superego, and ego? Right. So that's uh, Freud's uh, area of domain, right? He said we have the uh, id, the ego, and the superego. If I were to plug that into our philosophical discussion, the id would be the animal brain. That's your uh, instincts, right? Uh, that's the guy that immediately wants to uh, flip the bird to the guy who cuts you off in traffic. Uh, and then there's the ego, which is the um, capacity, the, the, the rational mind, right? The intelligent consciousness, the logical consciousness. That's the part of you that recognizes the guy who cuts you off in traffic. Well, it's already in the past and flipping the bird is not going to improve the situation in any way. So just let it be. And in in Freud's world, the the hyperego is the virtue framework 
in which, uh, or the virtual framework that the ego wants to follow. So it would be like, um, you know, we're trying to learn from our ancient stone guides to try and become more virtuous in the way we think. Well, that's, that's the hyper ego. That's where I'm trying to get to. So yeah, that's absolutely it. And I'm glad you mentioned it because at the beginning of the book, when I first introduced the duality, you know, at first it sounds kind of alien and esoteric, but then I explained, you know, we've seen this everywhere. So uh, Freud is one example I use. Uh, religion is another example I use. You know, every religion has some type of spirit or soul that they refer to inside uh, this corporeal body. Uh, that's that duality within, right? There's the there's that voice inside that wants to do the right thing, but then there's the body that's like, you know, I've had one heck of a day. I, I don't feel like it. I'm just going to, you know, kick off my shoes and watch that dynasty instead of try to learn something new, you know? Um, we've also seen it in cartoons, right? The, the little uh, characters, you know, angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other shoulder. That's that duality within, the lazy part of you. And then the part that's like, ah, I could do better. One thing when I was looking to stoicism was they say that you should take a break from society, just be on, like, disconnect from your phone, disconnect from everything. Hell, even like live in the woods for like a week or something. Does that include the um, id versus the ego where society tells us to fit into these confines or you can't do, I mean, you can't like go and just flip people off randomly. So yeah, does it include that being able to just take a break and do how much of what you want to do versus how much society tells you what to do? Okay, so one of the things I love talking about is these common misconceptions of stoicism that we have, and this is one of them. Unfortunately, stoicism has gotten such a bad rep in the past, about past decade, where it's been associated with this toxic masculine and masculinity, this machoism, this tough guy walking through a life with a stiff upper lip that doesn't feel anything about anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, like and, the like, Western cowboy guy. Right, right. And this whole thing about, uh, no, go be on, you know, be, be uh, by yourself and get out of society. So all these misconceptions, nothing could be further from the truth. Every single one of these is absolutely wrong. So in, in your case, in, in the case of, you know, go out into the woods and, and get away from society, uh, that's, a, that's a cynic approach. And the cynics were like an older cousin to the Stoics, right? The cynics um, were founded by a guy named uh, Antisthenes, who was a pupil of Socrates. And uh, it basically recognized that a lot of our angst, uh, anxiety, and affliction, and I say we because I consider the ancient Greeks in our modern times, that if we look at Homo sapiens, uh, 150,000 years, the past 2,000 years are still fairly modern, right? Yeah. And we and we see this in their you know in their writings because this is why Stoicism has stood the test of time. This is why Plato and, and Socrates are still relevant today because we haven't changed. Yeah, the technology has changed, and you know other realities in life have changed. But as a species, we haven't changed. But I digress. So uh, the cynics recognize that our society is completely fictitious, and we have fallen far away from our nature. And they stated that happiness is accessible to everybody, and it only has to do with living more in accordance with our nature than trying to fit into this fictitious society that we live in, okay? Uh, so Diogenes was uh, uh, Antisthenes' pupil, uh, and Diogenes is one of the most famous, uh, or, or rather is the most famous cynic philosopher. He is absolutely one of my favorite philosophers. And um, he would protest this fictitious society by, you know, he was the son of a banker. He gave everything up. He was living on the streets. And he would defecate in public on purpose, right? I have a chapter, actually, in my, in my third book uh, that I called Everybody Poops. And I talk about Diogenes, how he purposefully would defecate in public. He would purposefully masturbate and urinate in public to try and show the people, like, hey, guys, let, let's not it's ignore crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know he has quotes like i uh, um what was it uh, uh, i pissed on the man who called me a dog why was he so surprised and think about that for a second it's like we put so much weight into words and what other people think and say that we don't even like we make up this whole world around us and, and add value judgments to these things like uh, so he was just trying to teach us to get back to our nature and, and give up on this fake structure that was causing everyone anxiety. And today is 
kind of the same thing if you think about it. Uh, social media has, in fact, exasperated this problem. Everyone's trying to live up to a fake um, uh, a standard, right? And, and everyone's lying, right? Before we, before the, you know, in the before times when we could go outside, uh, we used to put on our, you know, your best clothes and your best look to try and present yourself as best as possible, right? But why? What does that actually mean if you think about it? So this was the whole cynic thing. And th this is where the ad adjective cynicism comes from, to be cynical, right? right? So I fast forward to the Stoics. Zeno Sidium, who was the founder of Stoicism, um, he was a cynic. He was trained in the cynic ways. So he absolutely, and as a Stoic myself also, I absolutely see the fictitious nature of this destructive fake society we live in with titles and, and material possessions and all this, all this stuff. However, this is where the Stoic differs from the cynic. We also recognize we can't change this, at least not overnight. And, and in my lifetime, I can't change the way society is. So how can I help my fellow human beings? Because virtue for us is better, betterment of humanity. I, I spend all my time trying to better humanity. And so how can I do that if I'm on the outside looking in? Right. Nobody wants to listen to their, you know, uh, I can't be that guy at Times Square holding up a sign saying the end is near, you know, no one's going to listen. So the Stoics chose to remain in politics, right? The Epicureans is another example. Uh, they were very close in the way they thought as the Stoics, but they chose to recluse themselves from society. They would go into communes and live in communes because they thought happiness was to be found in uh, uh, finding pleasure. Pleasure meaning, you know, live a simple life. The Stoics found virtue in helping others. And so they took office uh, spots. They took, they, they, they went into politics. Uh, they put their neck on the line, literally. You know, so many Stoics were uh, persecuted, uh, uh, um, murdered, or, or exiled because they stood up. They stood up to tyranny, right? They stood up to what was wrong. So uh, the analogy I like to use in my books as a Stoic, we hate the game but we're playing the board game just to help other players along. Okay. Be a part of the board game and make it better, improve on it. But let me ask, like with today, you mentioned like Instagram, things are phony, things are fake, and that definitely is bad. But isn't it good that society has some of those guidelines so we don't say like that guy defecate in public and do things like that? So this is, uh, again, great question. And it feeds, it's, it's going to feed right into what I love about Stoicism. So um, we, if we live in groups, okay, like if you ask like a Diogenes or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they're going to say civilization, it's just uh, trying to make up for its own errors as it makes up more errors, right? It's the beginning of all evil. But if we live in large groups, uh, you have no choice but to try and put some rules in place and uh public shame is one way to keep people uh behaving in a correct way if you will and this is where actually philosophy emerges from so if we rewind um go back four thousand years the greek states and cities uh three thousand years ago in, in ancient ionia the cities are growing so big they turn into what we now call polices, city-states, okay? And because there's so many people, you can't make everyone happy. They're trying to figure out what kind of rules to put into place to, to try and keep the population happy. Uh, this is where philo philosophy comes in. It's, it's trying to figure out how to live amongst people because you can't just, you know, you could be a tyrant, but that's not going to lead that's not going to leap for a happy kingdom for that long. People are going to rise up against you. And from the perspective of the people, uh, you know, it's, a, it's one thing to be governed and go through your day-to-day, -day, but you start kind of getting into these um, conflicts, if you will, right? Uh, conflict resolution. This is where the study of ethics comes from. Uh, so it all started when we started living in really big groups. So, yeah, to your point, absolutely. We do need some uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, what Diogenes was doing is... It was a protest. He wasn't trying to change anything. It was just a protest. Uh, so what the Stoics do is try to change the system from the inside. So you look at someone like Marcus Aurelius, who was a, a Stoic philosopher and the emperor of Rome. Uh, you know, there was slavery. He didn't abolish slavery in his empire. Uh, he didn't, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden women did not have equal rights uh, as, as men. However, he made some really extremely 
progressive changes regarding women and slavery, which in, you know, at the empire at the time, it was like, uh, like blasphemous, like salacious, you know, but, but he put those forth. So uh, it goes back to trying to make changes where you can as best as you can. That's what stoicism is, or actually, we didn't, I forgot to ask this at the beginning, but what is stoicism so the public knows? <laughs> sure. So uh, ancient Greece, uh, I've already kind of introduced it a little bit, you know, uh, philosophy comes about because people are trying to find a way uh, to live, to make sense of the world around them. And uh, we have some pre-Socratic philosophers uh, that come up with some ideas. Then Socrates comes, uh, if he existed, because of course we don't know for sure that he did. I don't know if Socrates uh, existed. No, we don't know that for a fact. It's the yeah. yeah so Socrates. I never knew that. <laughs> uh, so 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 let me put a footnote here. <laughs> it's called the paradox of Socrates. Socrates never wrote anything down. Okay, uh, kind of like uh, uh, there's a lot of philosophers who haven't written stuff down. Like Epictetus, a big Stoic philosopher, never wrote stuff down. But Socrates never wrote anything down, and we only know about him through one person, which is Plato. Okay, in Plato's books. Socrates is always that wise man who knows the right answer. Uh, so when all of your information for somebody comes from one single source, okay, a lot of stories, but still it's one source, right? It's just Plato. Uh, you, can, you can start having your doubts about whether he existed or not. Now, uh, there are only and only two single uh, written documents that Socrates' name exists in. Uh, and one of them is just making fun of him. Uh, because uh, as some of your listeners might or might not know, Socrates had both his lovers and haters. And at the end, he was actually convicted to uh, kill himself by a court in Athens. So uh, that leaves only one document outside of Plato's writings where Socrates' name is mentioned. So we, we, don't, we don't know for a fact that he did, but we assume he did because um, he was so impactful. You know, uh, it's hard to believe that Plato wrote uh, he wrote wow, 20, 27 treatises. Uh, that's huge. It's 27 full-size books almost. And that he would have invented uh, Socrates' uh, doctrines as well. It's hard to believe. So logic would dictate Socrates did exist. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so let me backtrack. So then Socrates comes about and completely changes the way we do philosophy and think about life. He introduces the study of physics, which is the natural sciences. Like back then, there weren't sciences like we have today. There were no niches like, you know, physics and chemistry and math and whatever, everything was just physics. Yeah. Um, he introduces uh, the study of logic and ethics. Why? Because you need to understand how the world works, physics. You need to be able to make logical sense out of this, the study of logic. And then you need to be able to figure out what the right decision is, knowing that with so many people around, you, you're gonna hurt some people. Uh, that's the study of ethics. All Hellenic philosophies to follow Socrates study these three general categories to varying degrees. And uh, there were four major, major Hellenic philosophies that came after Socrates, which was cynicism, uh, stoicism, uh, skepticism, and Epicureanism. Uh, today, we only hear about stoicism. It's the only one that's really stood the test of time uh, for a few reasons. One, it's the philosophy itself. It's so uh, boiled down to basics. There's no uh, necessity for uh, blind faith. There's no, you know, it's kind of like, okay, what can we all agree on? What is real? Let's focus on that. Uh, and if I can summarize, because your next question is going to be, you know, so, so what is the purpose of Stoicism? If I can summarize <laughs> it in one sentence. You see my paper? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my definition uh, of what the modern Stoa is, and that is, the pursuit of using the rational mind in the present moment as often as possible. That's how I would summarize Stoicism. Okay. What about, do you know who Marcus Aurelius is, if I'm saying that name right? Yeah, Marcus Aurelius. He's that emperor right. I was talking about. He said the quote, if I have to die, if it is now, then I will die now. If later, then now I will take my lunch. Since the hour for lunch has arrived and dying, I will tend to later. Yeah, so uh, just... Uh, I love that quote, but... It's a great quote. I, and I think that was Epictetus, if I'm not mistaken. What was uh, it? I saw it from a TED Talk, but all right, my bad. Maybe I took no, I'm pretty thing. sure that's Epictetus. Epi Epictetus was known for his zingers. Like, if there was a award we could give to the most likely to be a stand-up comedian, 
of all ancient philosophers, it would be Epictetus. He's awesome. Uh, really funny guy. So yeah, he said that if it's if I'm going to die, let me die now. If I'm not going to die, I'm going to have a sandwich because it's time for lunch. Um, this speaks to uh, the store. Oh, sorry about that. Let me put that What's silent that? right away. Um, also, that was a test. When I said Marcus and you said Epictetus, I was just testing you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so one of the many things... Okay, so we spoke about what Stoicism is at a high level. Uh, if you dig one layer deeper, there's like a couple of pillars that make the philosophy what it is. And one of them is we are in... We keep the idea of death very close. How close? I literally have remember death written on the inside of my forearm. All right, memento mori. Memento mori is a very uh, significant, um, uh, you know, idea that we keep at heart. Memento mori means remember death. Uh, why remember death? Not because we have a, a, a sick sense of humor, but because part of our effort is to recognize I can die before this conversation is over. I can die uh, tonight in my sleep. Uh, there's no guarantees. You know, we tend to live like we're going to live for 10,000 years. And then we wonder where all the time went when we're on our deathbed. So the reason we try and recognize the imminence of death at any point in time, uh, one, not to fear it for ourselves. Two, not to fear it for our loved ones, because that's one of the biggest sources of grief, right? If, uh, God forbid, something were to happen to my wife or my kids, uh, I would be absolutely distraught, right? But the, there's a there's a very fine line between literally losing your mind and and losing the rest of your life and and being um, uh, sad and and you know being you know you have to mourn, but you need to get back on the horse because there's other people that still depend on you. So uh, you know we we don't want to be afraid of death for ourselves and we don't want to be afraid of death for others. But here's the third and real reason why memento mori is so important because I'm aware of the imminence of death, my present moment and everything with which I interact becomes so important. Nothing is taken for granted when I am focused on death. To give you an example, today I had, I had a pretty hard day. Today. Like, it was pretty bad. And, you know, uh, I was having dinner and, and I was kind of like, I don't have it in me to do an interview tonight. You know, I, I don't feel like it. I just want to turn off my mind and just and that's when memento mori I, I actually i looked down and i saw the tattoo while i was you know mulling with my fork and i was like no i'm gonna do the interview i'm gonna talk to bill and i'm gonna reach more people with this good information and if it helps just one person i've made the world a better place that's what i want to do because i don't know if i'll get another chance to do this so this is why memento mori is is at the core of uh of, of our philosophy got it I like the um, willing yourself to do something. I actually made in 2018 my New Year's resolution, except for like crazy stuff like some crazy hard drugs. It would, my rule became say yes to everything that came my way. And I can't emphasize like the changes that made, like even having this podcast slash radio show. But if every day, like you said, if you try to make every day the best of its ability, say every day is amazing, doesn't that make no day amazing? So uh, a couple of things there. First, um, I love that you said say yes to everything because that would be the second most important um, saying in, in Stoicism, which is Amor Fati, right. which I have tattooed on the inside of my left arm. <laughs> well, Let's I just talk about that, that for, later on. I just picked that for no reason. I guess I'm a philosopher. <laughs> uh, you know, I, by the end of this conversation, you're probably going to say too, I hear this so often. People say, man, I've been a Stoic my whole life. I didn't know it. Uh, it, again, it speaks to how pure and simple Stoicism is. Um, we all have a little bit of that inside of us, which is why it resonates so well with people, which is why it's still around after two and a half thousand years. Um, well, let me get back to if every day is amazing, then doesn't that make every day not amazing? Uh, correct. But we don't chase amazing days. I don't find, so as a Stoic, you don't find your happiness in externals. There is no value judgment in externals. Uh, what are externals? Everything that is outside of my thoughts in the present moment. And that includes the body. My body is not part of me. My body is just a biosuit. 
my body is a vessel that I exist in. But my higher rational mind, um, when it thinks there, there's nothing that can go inside my squishy bits and make me think something some way, um, emotions are also externals because emotions are part of the body, which is why you can get upset with uh, the guy that cuts you off in traffic, but you have that choice and capacity to be able to just say, meh, and move on instead of getting angry and you know uh, start tailgating him and all this stuff. So we don't chase amazing days. I chase, I don't chase amazing moments either. I chase my best performance in this time, in this present moment, period. I live moment to moment, not to uh, make the most of the moment, but to live in the moment. So uh, uh, I'm a lot more, um, how would you say, uh, mindful of my present moment. So I don't see things as a good or a bad day. As soon as, I, and this is where we get into the third book. Uh, so when we're talking about this uh, 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 higher capacity living inside this body, we're talking about the second book, Your Duality Within. In the third book, we get into more uh, intention versus action. So I intend to do my best. So tonight I came to this interview to, to give you and your listeners my best. Uh, I might bomb it. I still have 40 minutes to do a, a very poor job for the rest of the way, right? I might bomb it, but my intentions are to do my best. And, and that's what I'm going to try and do. And as soon as my intentions are out there in the form of an action, it's kind of out of my control because microphone might cut off, sound quality might go bad, uh, you know, a meteor might come barreling down and hit me in the head and, and I can't finish this interview. Uh, you know, there's a myriad of reasons why this might not uh, end well, but none of that controls my intention. So as long as my intentions are my best, uh, I'm happy. And, and that's how I live. So the thing about stoicism that I found, and you kind of just said it here, is it's very focused on internal, like what you can control. And if you can't control it, say you just had an interview for a job, after the interview, you can't control if you get it or not. So just don't stress about it. We, life is short, time is short. We should try and control our world as much as possible because why waste it, right? However, we need to be able to clearly define what it is that we can control. And one mistake that we do in, in, in our you know, Western society is we try to control all the things that we actually can't, right? We, we, we try and control um, what uh, the, the person at the ticket counter is saying. We try and control what the kids are doing. We try and control how traffic around us flows. We try and control you know, the, the most absurd things instead of just looking inwards and, and saying, well, hold on, I have 100% control over my thoughts. Isn't that easier? Isn't it, you know, uh, here's a mental exercise for listeners that I like to use. If something bad happens, like, I, I don't know, you, you, you drop your favorite mug and it broke, right? It's a mug that brought you a lot of happiness at work. Uh, it's got your favorite joke on it. And, and um, let's say someone else drops it uh, and, and it breaks. So... Now you have a choice. You can get angry over this. You can get angry at the person for this. You can be upset over it. You can uh, pout for the rest of the day. But what's easier to change here? The event that happened or your attitude? And I'll take that question a step further and say, what is actually able to change? Can you, you know, uh, unhumpty dumpty that coffee mug and, and stick it back together or make it not happen? Or can you just change your attitude about it and say, well, it was a good ride while it lasted. I'm sad that it's gone, but it was just a mug. We move on. Yeah, but don't you also not want to be a pushover in life? Say somebody treats you wrong or poorly, don't you want some justice in the world? Absolutely. And if there's justice to be had, justice must be sought. However, uh, an eye for an eye will make the world go blind. So what is justice? Uh, and and uh, here we go to the, the, the four cardinal virtues of Stoicism. Uh, and one of them is the virtue of justice, which is what ought and ought not be distributed. Uh, we need to make a clear distinction that being accepting of reality is not passivity. Passivity is not the same as, you know, saying, ah, oh, well, that mug broke or yeah, that person cut me off is different than than saying, uh, you know, I deserved to be cut off or I deserved that mug to be broken. No, no, uh, you can't do anything about the mug. 
uh, the person who cut you off, you know, they're in a rush. Did they do it on purpose? Did they wake up in the morning twirling their mustache in the mirror like an evil villain thinking, I'm going to cut, how can I make Bill's life miserable today or upset him in some way, you know? Uh, we have to recognize what, what justice needs to be served. We tend to use excuses to try and act in an ignoble way. Uh, and if we use a rational mind, we can learn to seek justice, but still be kind, still be uh, 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 virtuous, benevolent, and uh, you know, not punish somebody else because reality is upsetting to us. So the person that dropped that mug, for example, chances are they knocked it over or didn't do it on purpose. Unless they came into your office, picked up the mug and threw it on the ground, there's no other scenario I can think of where it would require some type of justice. It was an accident. Do they even deserve you to be upset with them a little bit? No, not really. They're another human being that's just going about their day that didn't want to do bad. It was an accident. It was a mistake. So it's up to us to be able to let them go. But what about people that want to see the world burn? Uh, you'd have to give me a more yeah. specific uh, example. Uh, yeah, I'd say um, those people who just like hate the world for as it is, and they actually do want to cut you off on purpose. Or like, I guess you said it was somebody comes and breaks the mug on purpose, but can you just be passive to those people, but like all the same? So again, if, if justice needs to be sought, justice needs to be sought. Uh, you're not going to leave, uh, um, you know, a serial killer out on the loose because eh, it is what it is. No, you, you need to somehow lock them up away from society, not necessarily in a three by three jail cell, but you need to separate them from society so they don't do more damage. Right. Um, sure. Now there's three reasons why somebody would do wrong by you. One, it's either they're doing it on purpose, right? In which case, they don't know any better. They don't know any better than to, you know, they're not at the same level as you to be able to be uh, virtuous. As, as the Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, you know, an eye for an eye will make the world go blind. Maybe I did something wrong to them unwillingly in the past or willingly, and they're seeking retribution. Fine, they're doing it on purpose. But now the ball is in my court and it's up to me whether I want to, again, Recontribute to this cycle. So, if they're doing it on purpose, uh, they just don't know any better, and I have the choice to turn the other cheek. Again, we're not we're not discounting the fact that if we need to secure something, right? If this is like a serial uh, uh, mug smasher, we need to remove them from the premises so they can <laughs> smash any more mugs, right? Doesn't mean that they have to be uh, uh, punished uh, physically somehow. Or, or hurt or you know it doesn't mean that i have to go break their mug uh i know it's getting silly with the mug example here but i'm just going with the same uh same uh uh example uh the other reason why they might do wrong is because they just they didn't they didn't know they're unaware uh in which case why would i get upset with someone who wants to be uh who who didn't really want to do something wrong to begin with you know what i mean yeah. so either they did something wrong knowingly for whatever reason or they did something wrong willingly because i did something wrong to them in the past or they are doing it unknowingly and in all three cases i have the choice whether i want to be angry with them or not exclusive mutually exclusive from whether something needs to be done to secure uh you know society or mugs going forward Okay, this might be another misconception, like you said, when we started the podcast. But one of the things I'm seeing with stoicism, or one of the ideas I got, is to be content with your life and just enjoy your life. I mean, obviously, well, yeah, to just be content with what you have and enjoy what you have. So what if that's kind of the case, why would somebody bother following their dreams or like trying to start up their dream business or things like that? Right. Uh, great question. So here we're going to delve a little bit back into Amar Fadi. So Amar Fadi means love fate. Okay. Um, so let me start off by triggering some of your listeners. I'm going to ask everyone to think about like the worst thing that happened to them. Think about the worst thing that happened to you. And now what the Stoics will tell you is love that thing and love that moment. Why? Because uh, another uh, discussion in philosophy is this idea of de uh, a deterministic universe versus free will. Okay, 
uh, determinism states, uh, and, and a lot of scientists believe in determinism, which is why the sciences exist to begin with, uh, that everything happens for a reason. Therefore, there is an equation we can find so that if you plug in the right variables, you can get the answer of what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, determinism means everything dating back to the uh, Big Bang to now is a series of cause and consequences uh, and events. And what's going to happen next, it's already essentially predestined, predetermined, right? If we somehow had a machine that was big enough to process all the information in the universe that's existed since the Big Bang, we could very accurately then predict what's going to happen next. Um, an example we can use in a, in a much smaller cross-section of the universe is uh, a ball. If I pick up a ball and I let it drop, we can very accurately calculate how high it's going to bounce if we know four or five basic variables, right? The uh, uh, speed of gravity, uh, uh, the, the elasticity of the surfaces, the height of the ball, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have the equation to be able to very accurately calculate this. If we look at something more complex, like you know, uh, planets moving around other you know stars and all this stuff, we can still calculate those, but we need uh, you know advanced computer uh, programs and machines. But we can do this because we're sending satellites and probes and stuff to other you know heavenly bodies. Uh, if we go even more complex, we don't yet you know we don't have the equations yet to 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 be able to calculate these things. Uh, but the sciences are essentially trying to figure all of this out. The grand unifying theory, the theory of everything, these are uh, pursuits in trying to uh, outline how the visible universe, universe works. So the logic of determinism is very clear. It's hard to argue against, um, except we have this pesky little thing called free will. I absolutely feel like I have free will. Yes, I know logically what I'm doing here is a result of everything that's happened in my life. Everything I've learned, the emotions I feel right now because of the day I've had, the chemical reactions uh, because of what I've eaten uh, during the day, et cetera, et cetera. But I still feel like I can, you know, I have the choice to turn off the mic and walk away right now. I have the choice to have this conversation right now. I have the choice to say these words that are coming out of my mouth. So uh, there's this big argument in philosophy of which one is real. And Stoicism falls in the middle of these two and says, can't argue with determinism, but also can't argue with the with the with the illusion of free will. Yes, it's an illusion, but it's all too real, which is why we work so hard to be able to uh, make better choices with this free will that we have, fake or not. Um, so to get back to um, your your question of you know dreams versus. Uh, um, if all is for not, you know, why, why have dreams? Um, necessities, uh, let me quote Nietzsche here, he who has a how can deal with any, uh, or rather he who has a why can deal with any how. Okay, if you have a purpose, you can deal with anything life throws at you. Uh, which is why I'm, I chose my first book to be about finding one's purpose, right? The subtitle for the first book is, uh, finding a purpose and living an anxiety-free life. Uh, this, so we spend a lot of time taking care of our body, right? We go to the gym, we get haircuts, we wash ourselves, we get uh, piercings, tattoos, whatever, whatever. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to our physical necessities, but we pay zero attention to our spiritual necessities. And when I mean spiritual, I'm talking about um, the, the consciousness we have, the, the something more that we have inside that second voice um, finding one's necessity in life is the key to an anxiety-free life. And it is, this necessity is unique to everybody. Um, so again, in my book, I don't tell people what the purpose of life is. I give steps to people on how they can find their own. And one of these steps is, well, look, if we can't be certain that we're going to live past today, well, our necessity, like that thing that I need to do to be able to sleep at night and, and, and have a good night's sleep and feel good about myself uh, with knowing full well that I might not wake up the next day, this necessity must then be something I can do in the moment or today. Okay, it can't be something that takes a week, a month, or years to do, hence dreams. So your necessities cannot possibly be long-term dreams 
Because if your happiness is dependent on something that you don't even know if you'll have the time to accomplish, well, you're necessarily going to be miserable that whole time. So what, now, does this mean we shouldn't have dreams? No, absolutely not. We should have long-term goals as well. You should have a roadmap as to uh, what you want to do. In my case, it's the pursuit of virtue. I want to keep continuing to work towards the betterment of humanity, but I can't make humanity better. Uh, you know, I, I can't... Um, I don't know, take an example. I can't cure world hunger right now, right? But I can certainly work towards it slowly over the years by building connections and, and, and charities and whatever, what have you. That's a long-term goal. But my necessity is to be a good human being and help people. And that I can do through conversations, through being kind, polite, forgiving, benevolent in my uh, decisions in the here and now. So uh, that's how you can you know, have dream, long-term dreams but still live uh, with the proverbial guillotine uh, hanging over your head. You said virtue, like uh, you want to keep everybody happy each day, make the world a better place. But what if this is different from the, like the mug breaking argument, but what if like, I just want to focus on myself. Like what if I straight up say, I don't care about anyone else. I just want to make my life better, et cetera. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that because you are part of humanity. And by bettering yourself, you're bettering humanity, right? I spend a lot of time meditating. Uh, and, and in Stoicism, when we say meditating, it means uh, writing, journaling. Um, so I spend a lot of time meditating. I spend a lot of time reading and educating myself. And why do I do this? Because if I'm a better person, then I can make the world a better person. Uh, I can what if I'm not a better, a better person? person? Like, what if I'm just a bad person who, like, only cares about myself? Well, then that's your choice, right? We're not here to push agendas on anyone. Uh, and Stoicism, one of the things uh, Seneca teaches us is you only talk to a listening ear, okay? If somebody doesn't want to hear about uh, what's my purpose in life, we're not going to jam this down someone's throat, right? It's only when people come looking for uh, answers and they start asking the right questions, Stoicism might offer uh, a, a good answer to some people. In my case, it certainly did. In my case, when I logically went through one by one, like, okay, so what is my life's purpose? What, what am I doing here? What can I do here? What seems right? Uh, it took a while. Uh, you know, let me, let me backtrack here. So I wasn't, you know, I was a, if I go back 15 years, I was a CPA out of school, uh, crushed it in school. I got a great job. Uh, within five years, I had an executive level job, six figure salary, uh, you know, house, kids, dogs, check, check, check. I had everything that I was told by society that I should have. Uh, and, and that that would also give me happiness. And I realized I'm not happy. And that's when I started my own re-education, if you will. And that's when I switched to being a, a philosopher because uh, I was looking for a way to live a good life. And when I did my, uh, you know, I thought over this for years and years, I recognized that the only true meaning for me was to make humanity better and work towards the betterment of humanity. Uh, and when I truly embraced this after, you know, a few years of uh, practicing Stoicism is when I started reaching out passively to people who, who are interested in hearing about it. And at first it was just conversations. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I decided to write the book and then there was the podcast and, and, and I see there's an appetite for this, but I'm sharing my story to answer your question. If somebody is just selfish, well, that's fine. They're also part of nature. They're also, uh, you know, the same. Um, and, and I never finished my train of thought on, on determinism, which I can do now. Uh, the same universal reason, this cause and the sequence of cause and consequence that made me be and made me be conscious and alive today also made the worst thing in my life happen, also made the person who's super selfish, also made everything else, good or bad, around me. So I have to say yes to all of it. I have to accept all of this because without this, without those things, I wouldn't exist as well. It's the same universal reason that's making all of this happen. It's the same sequence of cause and consequence. This is what Amar Fadi uh, uh, means. And this is why that's so important. So you said you had like the house, the family, the kids, the everything, and yet you weren't happy. 
with stoicism, is there ever any intrinsic value in anything? Or is everything just a bunch of extrinsics trying to build to an intrinsic that doesn't exist? Uh, it's going to, uh, all right. It's, it's going to be hard to answer because of the, 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 the lexicon and, and, and semantics, but let's put it this way. Uh, there is no good or bad in anything outside of my own judgments and intentions because I have no control over anything outside of those two. I might have uh, influence to varying degrees, right? I have influence over my body a lot more than my thoughts, uh, but my body, you know, it might conk out at any time. It might get sick and, and have the flu. It might do this, that, and the other. I don't have control of that. But my thoughts and my intentions are entirely, and I mean entirely within my control. So logically, rationally, anything that's like a gamble that I don't have full control over with 100% of certainty cannot possibly be good or bad. It just is. The only thing that can be good or bad is what I can do. And that's my judgments and intentions. So everything that's good or bad becomes internal to my thoughts and intentions. Maybe I, re I worded it wrong as like uh, external versus internal. I mean, um, I remember in philosophy, extrinsic is you go to school, you get your degree, like you keep building towards something that's good in itself. Like they say like there's no intrinsic in life, like nothing is ever pure good in itself. We're always just trying to build towards something very good. But then you can also say, oh, getting a college degree, that could be intrinsic in itself or something like that. Does that make sense? Am yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you mean. Um, so uh, I, again, uh, good is internal. However, uh, pursuing knowledge externally can help us access that internal better. So um, what you're referring to is, you know, knowledge you're born with and knowledge you uh, apprehend throughout, throughout your life. The more we learn, the more we know, the better we can be internally. Um, I, you know, along with philosophy, I also study a lot of history because by reading history, I can learn more about my fellow human beings. I can see why things happened the way they did in the past to better forgive them today. Um, so we absolutely, absolutely can find good uh, in, in that sense. Okay. So, but, but again, the end result is always my effort in the present moment. Let's not forget I, my, the definition, if I boil down stoicism, is use of my rational mind in the present moment as much as possible. Being more educated on this topic definitely helps to be more present in the moment, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Now, also earlier, though, you said determinism. And you think that there's no, you think there is free will, there's not no free will? Because like you said, anything can be calculated in physics or anything could be calculated. But say, through evolution, through these properties tend to make the next generation live better. Can't you say that there's no free will, we're just simply a product of these personalities tend to survive and live on? Yeah, I mean, look, um, determinism is, is really hard to argue against, especially in, in our modern times when the sciences kind of have, you know, we're all exposed to it. You go back, you know, 200 years ago and sciences are very esoteric. Uh, we grew up. We grew up with sciences. In, it, we started in elementary school, and it was, I think, it was Max Planck that said uh, an experiment is a question, uh, which you know scientists post in Nature, and measurement is a recording of its answer. Right? Um, determinism. It, it, again, logically, uh, un, unless you want to oppose it with uh, just blind faith. It's, a, it's, it's for sure a thing. However, however, as a compatibilist, it's hard to also argue against this illusion of free will. And this becomes very, it becomes a very broad topic because, and, and I talk about this in my third book, reality becomes a very broad topic. And, and I don't go too far down this rabbit hole because you can really go crazy thinking about what is real, what is reality. Like everything's a simulation. 
Yeah. Elon Musk. <laughs> well, you know, Elon Musk is not the one that came up with this. He's just the yeah, yeah. most most recent fam famous person to say it. But absolutely, uh, you know, uh, I, I I believe also that we're probably in a simulation. Simulation theory makes sense. Um, reality. I mean, think about it. Look at anything. Look around at anything, uh, and it won't fit inside your head. Yet we know that we see all of this inside our head. So if it's not actually in there. It's a projection. So how do we know, <coughs> excuse me, that it actually exists? You cannot possibly know. As a colorblind person, my whole life, people always ask me, oh man, what do you see? What colors do you see? How can you, how do you know this, that, and the other? I say, look, let me ask that with another question. How do you know that the color red that you see is the same as the color red that somebody else sees? Like, how do you know? You'll both point at the same object and say, this is red and point at another object that's red and say, yes, this is red, and you'll both agree, but you cannot possibly know for, for sure that you see the exact same shade of color when you say red as somebody else, right? It's reality is subjective. Um, but again, as a Stoic, uh, I recognize this question of reality and, and, and illusion of free will, not something that's going to be solved in my lifetime. And it has no impact on whether I'm being a good person and living a good life right here and right now. So uh, this is where the idea of compatibilist comes from. You know, uh, yes, determinism exists, but yes, I also have free will or at least the illusion of it. Uh, we are a, both the spectator and the actor of the cosmic script, if you will. One fun thing about determinism I read, you know, uh, you put a goat in the middle of an abyss, like there's absolutely nothing, no, sure, there could be air, but you put a piece of food to its right, and you put that same exact piece of food to its left, the same exact distance, the same everything, without free will, that goat technically will just stand there and starve, because it won't be able to make the decision left versus right, because they're both equally valuable. You ever hear that? Um, I've never heard that one, and I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you, you know, the, the, uh, the one I do like, because, uh, again, determinism, it's usually there's not a lot of arguments. There's not a lot of uh, discourse around that. It's, it's hard to argue against determinism. But I have heard this, and, and I use this actually in my book, for uh, free will. So we like to think we're free, right? You're, we're free to go do anything we want, make any decisions. Um, like uh think about a cow a cow also is free to walk about it's not chained up it's not it doesn't have a leash to pull it this way or that and the other right and when the herd starts moving towards the grazing grounds the cow has a choice to just stand where it is or follow the herd towards the grazing grounds and the cow will choose to put one hoof in front of the other and go towards the food and you know he makes a free choice based on free will right but let's think about this the cow has been engineered through you know over thousands of generations of cows to be a herd animal and to follow the herd to follow the other cows so when the cow feels like it's making a free choice is it really is it really free to make that choice is it really making a free choice to say i i, I want to go this way because i choose to or is it programmed in him right in the same way if we want uh, uh the example used in my book you know you might feel like you're free because you're craving a burger and you have the financial means uh, to go get a burger. And so, hey, you're a free man. I'm gonna drive down to whatever burger joint and get this burger because I can and life is awesome and I live in the free world. But think about that decision for a second. Is being able to do what you think real freedom or is understanding why you wanna do something real freedom? Why did you want that burger? Is it possible that you saw, uh, uh, you know, 15 Burger King commercials during the football game on Sunday and all of a sudden you're craving a Whopper? Could it be that you smelt uh, barbecue in the distance while you were walking home and, you know, you, now you're a slave to your tummy's cravings? Uh, is that freedom? Are you making free choices? Um, so, so free will is, you know, it's a very, it's, it's hard to believe in free will as well. But the illusion is so real to us from a subjective perspective that it would be wrong to ignore it in our search for uh, 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 a way to live a good life. How can you live a good life if you ignore something that is real to you, even though it might be fictitious, right? Yeah. That's why I find so interesting about determinism, because 
literally every emotion you feel or every response you've ever had could just be like hard wiring in uh of your system to again survive or just do what's efficient but then again every emotion we feel everything like that is as real as the air i'm breathing right now exactly so all right and, so, and, and sorry to interrupt you but you oh, know this is this is one of the reasons that stoicism makes sense to me uh, earlier on we spoke about how i recognize the fictitiousness of this world but i don't have to ostracize myself and, and be some kind of outsider to be a good person so i appreciate that about stoicism like yeah i'm still an executive and i'm still a cpa but i'm a stoic that's helping uh, people along the way right uh, the other thing uh, is i recognize determinism but does that mean that i believe we should free all criminals because well it wasn't their choice. They're not bad people, man. You know, just this is the way it is. This is the way the universe wanted it. No, I don't believe that either. So uh, again, as a Stoic, I, I, I fall in the middle of the spectrum here. These are these are the things I really appreciate about Stoicism. It's like I said at the beginning of the interview. It really just accepts reality uh, as best as we can see it and our nature, right? Uh, again, free will. I know it doesn't really exist, but in my short lifetime. It's always going to be real. So I have to learn to use it as best as I can, even though I know it's not real. In the same way, I have to learn to uh, function as best as I can in this fictitious world, even though I know it's not real. Nice. Before I move on, is determinism like stoicism's arch rival, or do you guys work hand in hand? No, we're compatibilists. We work hand in hand. We accept that uh, we live in a deterministic world. Uh, hence Amor Fadi, right? We were talking about that before, love fate. Uh, love fate means um, just say yes to everything. Love everything, right? We touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, even if I lose a loved one, I have to not just accept it, but love that because it's that same universal reason, i.e. the deterministic you know, algorithm, whatever, that made that event happen that's making me be alive and think right now and giving me the opportunity to be a better person, to make the world a better place. It's, it's all one and the same. So no matter what tragedy strikes me is just as good or bad as the quote unquote best day of my life. It's all one and the same, all these externals. Uh, I focus internally on my choices, even though I know free will is an illusion because I feel like I have control, so I have to be able to make the best decisions as I can of my choices. So I, again, always middle of the spectrum. All right, you say uh, even if you lose like a loved one, you should love it, I guess, in order to find peace or some, something along those lines, but why not hate it? Like if you lose a loved one, that, that's gotta suck for anybody. So why kind of love it or why even accept that? Why not just hate it? Well, you know, we're not saying uh, you should be doing cartwheels and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I hope <laughs> <yeah>. not. <laughs> uh, no, you, 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 you still have to mourn because, uh, you know, another misconception of stoicism is that we don't have emotions. No, no, uh, we absolutely have emotions because we exist in these bodies that have emotions. We can't deny them. We can't ignore them. We can't bottle them up. We have emotions. This is why we will always be imperfect. However, what is hating it going to do what is hating it gonna, gonna give me? It, hate is not gonna be conducive to any positivity. Yeah, I can mourn, but hate is not gonna help me continue to try and make the world a better place. Hate was only gonna make me be a worse person or use it as an excuse and justification to not be my best and make my best decisions in the moment. Uh, that's why, because I have the choice. What about, Say you, you mourn, you accept it, but say 40 years down the road or down the future, can't you still strongly dislike it versus love it? Right. So this is where we get into uh, preferred and dispreferred. So externals, we've already established externals as everything outside of my judgment and my intentions. Okay. Uh, I would still, let's, you know, let's be honest. If I have a choice between someone barging into my house and cutting off my right leg and not barging into my house and not cutting off my right leg, I would very much prefer that they don't barge in and cut my leg. You know what I mean? Uh, if I have a choice between being murdered and not murdered, yeah, I prefer not to be murdered. So I do have preferences, but it's important to 
make that distinction that uh, preference is one thing, uh, a hope, uh, a, a, a wish, and a denial of reality is another thing. So let's say somebody does barge into my house and chops off my right leg. Well, it happened. Again, I cannot change the event that happened, right? I can only change my opinion of it. But before it happens, I'm not going to say, or even after it happens, I'm not going to say, well, you know, I, I prefer that it would have happened. No, I, 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 it's a dispreferred. It's a dispreferred external. But if reality, if it does happen and reality strikes, well, I have to embrace it. It's done. It's happening. There's only one reality. We don't have a second reality that we can escape into. I cannot make that unhappen. You know what I mean? So that's why we have to learn to love it. Uh, now, between you and me and, uh, you know, the internet, there is uh, no way, no way that anybody could be indifferent to a tragedy like losing, let's say, God forbid, a child uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, you would absolutely feel saddened, uh, distraught, uh, dead inside over it from time to time. The point we're making here is you have to try. You have to try and see things rationally. Kids die all the time. Kids die everywhere. Why is mine excluded from this? It sucks that it happened, but it happened. So do I use that as an excuse to give up on life? Or do I continue to try my best? So that's the difference. You have to keep walking. You can't let it just live in the back of your mind rent-free for the rest of your life. Exactly. And the other key point, you cannot be upset over being upset. Yes, <laughs> it's going to suck. It's going to hurt. And you know what? There are some mornings I'm probably going to wake up and be like, nah, bro, I can't do this. But that's that's. I have to accept that too. I have to love that too. I have to love the fact that I'm imperfect. So to say, you know, love everything doesn't mean we're walking around, you know, being aloof to everything and, and, and uh, passive to everything. No, no, we're saying that is the definition of virtue. If we could be 100% virtuous all the time, then we would not care about anything. But let's be very honest, we're going to care about stuff. Let's just focus on trying our best, though. Got it. Now, talking about life and death and all that, the million dollar question. What is the meaning of life? Ah. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about suicide because uh, socialism also has a big thing with suicide. Oh, really? Well, uh, if you want to yeah. talk about that too. Oh, uh, it's a hot topic because, um, you know, if we, if we define stoicism as um, using your rational mind in the present moment as best as you can, nothing in that statement has anything to do with one longevity of life or two, being around if your rational mind is no longer working. Um, you know, I, ha I have, I see these, you know, we, we, we all know cases of people who are alive in the body, but not there in the mind. Is that really being alive? Or are they being kept alive for the sake of other people not feeling sad? You know, the engine's running, but no one's behind the wheel type of thing. Um, so as a stoic, Personally, I would not want to be alive in the body if this mind, this mind that's talking to you right now is going to be hopefully around for many, many years. But if somehow the body outlasts this mind, I don't want to be around because what's the point? Then I'm just hydrogenating carbon dioxide. I'm not doing anything else. I'm eating food and passing it on. That's all I'm doing. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and so part of stoicism when we talk about do your best, endure anything, right? Today was a great example. I, I physically, my body wanted to give up on this interview today because I was just I'm, I'm, I'm mentally drained, uh, physically, you know, uh, pretty tired. But I said, no, 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 we go on, we do this. We do this because it's the right thing to do. And the day I'm no longer able to make these decisions, the day I'm no longer able to endure hardship and do the right thing, uh, maybe is the day I'm already dead. You know, being alive physically doesn't mean I'm alive mentally. And if the real me is the mental me living in this vessel that's the physical body, uh, my definition of being alive resides with my uh, mental capacities, right? Um, 
So usually, and that's why I thought we were going to ask about uh, suicide because it's a hot topic with stoicism because there's a lot of quotes, a lot of quotes about suicide and how, you know, you endure all you can until you can't and then the exit is no longer, you know, further from your wrists. These are, they get taken out of context a lot. Uh, so unless you know the background of what it actually means on how you just suck it up and you do the right thing no matter what and until you physically or mentally can't, um, uh, that, that's what those mean. Uh, Epictetus has another one about uh, uh, um, a house uh, and there's a fire inside and you're trying to save people and you go back into the house as much as you can to, to try and navigate the corridors as best as you can. Uh, and only when you can't do that anymore because the smoke has gotten too thick, uh, only then and only then do you take the exit out the door. And here the reference is to suicide again. We deal with the crap that society, this fake society throws at us as much as we can because we want to help the people along as best as we can. Nothing justifies giving up on life or people. And you only stop when, you know, your consciousness is ready to give up. Otherwise you keep on going. There is no excuse like I had a tough day. I had a long day. So I deserve to be rude or, or I deserve to be, uh, selfish or whatever. No, we keep working towards the betterment of humanity. We can endure it until we just want to, until, you know, you turn the, the engine off completely because either the body has run out of fuel or the mind has left before the body. And to clarify to some of your listeners, what, what I mean by if the mind leaves the body before, uh, if the mind leaves this world before the body, you take someone like Frederick Nietzsche, who was a spectacular philosopher, right? A great mind, wrongly associated with the Nazis. Uh, again, if, if uh, just for the purpose of your uh, benefit of your listeners, he was very much against the Nazi movement. It's because he went insane at the end of his career and his sister, who was a Nazi sympathizer, took over his work. Uh, uh, she's the one that then adapted his work to uh, fit the Third Reich's uh, agenda. So what happened to Nietzsche is he, uh, because of syphilis, he quite literally lost his mind, uh, broke down in the middle of the street one day after saving a horse from being flogged. And he spent the last few years of his life in mental institutions to the point where he suffered from coprophagia, which is when you eat your own feces. He, he literally lost his mind. And look what happened to his work for, uh, uh, you know, a better part of a century, half a century, he was associated with Nazism when he his work was actually very much against uh, against that you know his famous quote uh, God is dead and we killed him up until you know 10 20 years ago people thought he was one of these uh, uh, atheists um, a modernist that was very much uh, anti-religion anti-soul but it's because his work wasn't as as, as uh, uh, accessible because he had that Nazi kind of footnote on him. But now history has absolved him. And now we know, you know, his quote, when he says, God is dead and we killed him, he's saying quite the opposite. He's saying, guys, let's be careful here. Uh, modernity and, and, the, and the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution has made us lose our uh, compass, our, our soul, our purpose. And this is going to be a great sec to your question of what is the purpose of life. Uh, Nietzsche was warning us against being divided uh, nationalists and individualists, uh, which is what we see today. He, um, maybe you said, and I missed it, but didn't he create his own philosophy? I forgot what it was called. I think one of my friends follows it, but didn't he create his own philosophy along the lines of life, life is what it is. You, there's no meaning to it or something like that. So you, I think you're referring to nihilism. Yeah. nihilism, uh, Or maybe I said it wrong. Yeah. Uh, no, I, you don't forget in Canada, we pronounce things differently. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so nihilism uh, or nihilism, he, he didn't really invent it necessarily, but yes, he was a big proponent of it. Uh, and actually, a fun fact, Amar Fati, which is associated with the Stoics, was never really used by Stoics. It was Nietzsche that coined the phrase and associated it with the Stoics. Uh, and we still use it today in, modern, in the modern Stoa because it's a very great uh, uh, summary of, you know, uh, love fate, love what happens. So as far as nihilism is concerned, uh, the basis of many philosophies, including cynicism and stoicism, uh, is nihilism, meaning 
yeah, it, it's all for nothing. We're just matter floating through the cosmos. We're stardust. Everything is just matter taking different forms and shapes. We just happen to be the most complex form of matter that we have observed. And we happen to have the very unfortunate side effect of being self-aware and self-aware of our uh, impending death. And so why bother to do anything, right? Uh, this is where cynicism stops. Epicureanism takes it a step further and says, well, might as well try and have fun while we're here. You know, what the, what the, what the heck, we're here anyways. So let's try and have some, a little fun. Stoicism takes it another step forward and says, yeah, we should have some fun, but what is fun? Fun is, you know, look around you. There, 100 billion human uh, beings have walked the earth. And how many more billions are going to come after me? And my work is not going to last, you know, the test of time. No one's going to be talking about Anderson Silver a thousand years from now. No one's going to be talking about Anderson Silver a uh, hundred years from now. But today, I can have conversations with people. I'm having a conversation with Bill. I'm making new connections and just trying to share some wisdom, trying to spread some knowledge to try and make the world a little bit better because, I mean, what the heck? I'm here anyways, right? And so this is where stoicism uh, takes it a step further. Uh, like I was saying before, like I, I recognize the game is fictitious and I recognize it's all for naught. But I got to do something, right? I'm here. Hmm. That kind of answers this question too, or it could. But prior, you were talking about uh, stoicism's relation with, say, suicide and quotes like that. What do you say to people who are in a rut where they wake up, go to work, go to bed, wake up, go to work, go to bed, or even people that suffer from depression and they don't even know like why to go on? Uh, I say buy my third book. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, but seriously, I discuss exactly this uh, because I share my own story of uh, how I was just going through the routine. You know, every day is exactly the same. Uh, so finding your own purpose, we go back to the Nietzsche quote, he who has a why can endure any how. Uh, we have to find our why. We have to find our necessity. And so you asked, what is the purpose of life? If you ask the physical universe, the almighty cosmos, what the purpose of life is, the answer is very simple. It's hydrogenating carbon dioxide. Because all matter that we observe everywhere in the universe and on Earth is working towards reaching a higher level of entropy. And we are very good at taking carbon dioxide and turning it into higher levels of entropy like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and whatever, whatever. Um, so from a physical laboratory perspective, that is the purpose of life, hydrogenating carbon dioxide. It's a bummer. It's a bummer to hear that because we're so smart and so intelligent and so self-aware, then you realize all we're meant to do is eat carbon-based food and then turn it into methane. And you're like, ah, all right, so why even bother to get out of bed? I'll just wear the pens and you know, eat pizza in bed. Um, from the spiritual perspective, from the mental perspective, we have to find that higher purpose that we have. And I cannot give that answer to anyone. It is subjective to everyone. Uh, nobody can give themselves better advice than their own rational mind, right? Uh, in my case, I found my purpose, the main one being helping better humanity. Uh, I have a, a, a other few ones that, that I've also outlined that I live by. It literally drives my days, my, 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 my uh, thought process. And uh, again, in my first book, I, taught, I, I have like a, a couple of, you know, a dozen or 15 steps to help the, the reader identify their own purpose. But there are things that for sure make you happy. And I'm sure you can all relate to days where you've gone to bed, not just happy because you had like a, you know, it was a great meal or it was a fun party, but you went to bed with this sense of fulfillment. So it's those things that you did that you have to try and prioritize. Not making money, not getting attention, not getting likes on social media, not, you know, driving a better car than your neighbor or whatever. You have to tap into... Uh, you know, helping someone cross the street, it makes everyone happy, doesn't it? 
when you stand out uh, next to a river and you hear the water flowing and you hear the leaves fluttering and the birds chirping, it makes anyone happy, right? It's these type of fundamental things that we have to tap into and find purpose in. Uh, and, and that's how you really find tranquility and, and an anxiety-free life uh, that, that helps you be more kind of grounded and mindful in your present moment. So you would say finding purpose and fulfillment in everyday life, that's the meaning of life? I, I think identifying your meaning in life, your purpose in life, uh, gives you that meaning. So, so yeah, the, the, it's, it's all one and the same, right? It's like the recycling sign, one arrow leads to the other. You find your purpose, you f then you find meaning, and then you find happiness. And then all of a sudden, all this other nonsense doesn't affect you as much. You, you, you don't care. Everything just kind of fits into its place. Okay, got it. So what's, what's the final message or the final thing you'd like to tell the audience? Um, take a moment. Take a moment and listen to yourself because we are very guilty as a society of always being distracted, whether that distraction is social media, gaming, um, uh, uh, food, work, you know, we're all workaholics. Uh, take a moment to think and to talk to yourself and ask yourself the right questions. And the first one you should be asking yourself is, are you living your life the way you want to? Are you living the life that you want to fulfill? All right. Well, this has been the Way Podcast found on FM 91.7 WHUS stores at the top of the hour. To find more, go to podcasttheway.com. Thank you, Anderson Silver, for coming out. As always, deuces.